Bien, mesdames, et, mesdames et messieurs, je demande votre attention. Nous avons maintenant une discussion, une table ronde qui sera modérée par Fiona Harvey. Fiona Harvey, journaliste, reporter de l'environnement, guardian. C'est une grande spécialiste, elle a aussi été rédactrice pendant de nombreuses années de notre revue L'Optimiste. Fiona, you have the floor, please, to present your panelist, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, yes, I, I have the pleasure of being in the correspondent at a very interesting time uh, when it comes to, to climate change in particular. Um, we heard this morning in our opening session uh, some great stuff on uh, where we are in relation to uh, the world's environmental problems, but climate change, of course. And climate change is dominating all the discussion at the moment because of Paris, uh, which we heard a lot about in the morning session in terms of where we are versus where we need to be uh, in relation to the Paris conference and in relation to scientific advice. So we're going to move on uh, the discussions now. Um, we're going to talk to a very distinguished, well, you're going to hear from, uh, and I'm going to talk to, um, a very distinguished uh, panel uh, here, um, who I will introduce to you uh, in a moment. Um, we're going to hear uh, about the, the, not just the challenges uh, that we face, uh, but some of the solutions. We're going to hear about the importance of development amidst these discussions, and how can we ensure that countries and people, people, are actually lifted out of poverty and enjoy better and more secure lives even while we deal with climate change. This is not an insoluble problem by any means, but at the same time, it's not an easy problem to solve. So that's what we'll be looking at today. So we have coming up, we've got uh, Graham Maxton, who's the Secretary General of the Club of Rome. We have Martin Beniston, who's joining us today from the University of Geneva. We have Mona Mansing, formerly of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, now uh, at his Institute for Development. And we have Ivo Slice, uh, Honorary President of the World Academy of Art and Science. So I'll introduce them uh, one by one. They will make their opening remarks, um, and then we will have uh, a broad discussion in which you will be invited to take part. So to leave more time for that discussion, I'll get on the stage. Graham. Merci, vous avez compris. Alors, chacun va être présenté, se, se présenter. Ensuite, Fiona euh, ouvrira la, les questions-réponses. Ces messieurs sont à disposition tout à l'heure. Alors, qui commence Fiona, who is, who is starting Ah, Graham Maxton, qui est le secrétaire général du Club de Rome. Uh. Pierre, Fair, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have the chance to talk to you today. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, just go through a few slides that we are putting together for a new report, which will be published in about six or eight weeks. We're trying to answer the question, is it possible to move to a better economic system without, without a collapse, without making things worse? Because when you try and reduce the energy that we burn every day or we try and reduce the amount of materials we use every day, you have to slow the economy down. When you slow the economy down, you tend to create unemployment and increase inequality. And so we're on something of a treadmill. So there are lots of people looking at the question of what would a better economic system look like, a system where there is less inequality, where there is jobs and incomes for everybody, where we're living in harmony with the planet. That's not what this is about. What we're trying to answer is can we move from here without making things worse. I want to start with a chart which is, if there's one picture that sums up the Club of Rome, this is it. This is what's called the standard run model from World 3, which was published in the Limits to Growth in 1972. It looks at 200 years of human history. It's not actually about economics, it's about the ecological footprint. It, well, that term wasn't coined in 1972, but this is about our ecological footprint. And you can see 
as you move across, you can see the different factors that are involved, um, population, industrial output, raw materials. And you can see that when the, the, the chart was originally drawn, the black line in 1972, and you can see the red line, which is where we are today. And we predicted in 1972 that if we carried on increasing the throughput of resources and we carried on increasing the population, then we would hit a crisis around the middle of this century. That the use of resources, the pollution, would eventually lead to a decline in economic output and a decline in population. Now, I think what's particularly important is we've been largely right. We've gone back every 10 years or so and we've tracked what's been happening versus what we predicted would happen and what is happening today is almost exactly what we predicted. And so we're heading towards that crisis that we talked about more than 40 years ago. So where are we today? Because we've been using too many of the world's resources, creating too much pollution, and all of the problems that Martin talked about earlier on, we're in overshoot. You can see the, 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 the horizontal line of this chart is, is the Earth's capacity, the carrying capacity of the planet. And the little dotted line shows that we're pushing that downwards. We're actually reducing the carrying capacity of the planet. If we carry on, business as usual, we will shoot up and require increasing number of planets, if it was possible, to live sustainably. And obviously it's not. So at some point, there has to be a collapse, or we have to manage a process back down to live within the planet's carrying capacity. And that's the challenge that we face in the next decade, two decades, is how do we manage that process without creating an even bigger problem economically, socially, and politically? Let's go through a few charts. So since we had the world 1972, continue developing models. Um, Jürgen Randers, one of the members of the Club of Rome, one of the original authors of Limits to Growth, has been developing a model, developing out to 2052. And I'm going to show you some of the forecasts that we've got if we don't change. The first one is simply economic growth. That if we carry on the current path, then global GDP will continue to rise because that's what we're doing. We're trying to increase global GDP every year. And that by around 2050, world GDP will be about, about 147, 150 trillion dollars GDP, twice the level we have today. But the rate of growth will slow, and there's a variety of reasons for that. It's going to slow in the developed world because the developed world economies are much more mature than the developing world. You can see here what's happening in the developed world. This is the OECD. And you can see back from 1960 uh, right the way through to today and then projecting forward, the GDP per head gradually going down. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. We had lots of growth in the developed world after the Second World War. We did our economy more from manufacturing into where it's harder to get growth, which comes from productivity improvements. Demographics, we have aging populations in much of the developed world. So all these changes mean that GDP per head is declining. And within a few years, in some parts of the world, it will turn negative. Now, that's not that GDP will turn negative, but GDP growth per head will turn negative. And that will happen faster in places like Germany and Poland, where the populations are older, and is happening faster in places like Japan. It'll take a little bit longer in places like the US and Australia with younger populations and more immigration. But the, the growth that we've had for the last 30 years will not continue no matter what any politician does. So we're in a long, slow period of decline. What else will happen? Well, uh, inequalities will grow. There's something in economics called the Gini coefficient, and put very simply, the higher the Gini coefficient, the more inequality. If Gini coefficient is 100, then one person in that society has all the wealth. And if the Gini coefficient is zero, then wealth is equally divided. And you can see what's been happening here, both within uh, countries and between countries. From 1820 through to 2000, and we know that inequality has got worse since then, and we know that the economic system is driving it to increase further. And you can see that within countries, the inequality is exactly the same as it was almost two years ago. But all this economic development, all this economic growth that apparently is so good and leads to this trickle-down effect, has actually had no effect at all. In fact, the only time that inequalities narrowed 
was particularly after the Second World War, when there was high levels of unionization and a stronger welfare state. But the inequality today, the gap between rich and poor today, is exactly as it was 200 years ago. And between countries, so between the rich world and the poor world, it's much bigger. So the gap between places like Africa, and India, and South America with the rich world is much bigger today than it was 200 years ago. So that's what all that economic development has brought us, what brought what it promised. One of the other factors which we talked about earlier on is what's going to happen to unemployment. Because of technology which will take more jobs, because we have a higher birth rate, because we have more older people who will need to work longer because they haven't saved enough for their pensions, there will be more and more demand for jobs. And at the same time, there's not enough jobs to fill those places, and so unemployment will rise. And so this is going to be a huge social issue, not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world. You can see the effect there, that by 2050, if we carry on down the current path, almost two billion people in the world will be unemployed. So we need to make some big social changes. This is not just about climate change. We need to reduce the gap between rich and poor. We need to reduce the, the level of unemployment and give people meaningful lives if we're to overcome the climate challenge. And what is the climate challenge? I thought I'd show that graphically as well. You can see this dotted line at the top, which is the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, you can see today, it's just short of 400. In fact, it's 401 today, 401 uh, parts per million of carbon CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's generally accepted when we get to about 450, that that then means that we cannot avoid a two degree increase in average temperatures. Now there's a lag between when we reach that 450 level and when it actually reaches the two degree centigrade. And you can see it on this chart, the X, we will reach that two degree threshold, that 450 parts per million, sometime around 2035 if we don't change what we're doing. And that means it's the two degrees in 2050. So we've only got 20 years to stop this. Otherwise, we move ourselves into a much more serious situation. And let me just show you what that means. This is climatic history for 80 million years. You can see there how the temperature of the planet has reduced and then you see it much more volatile, but over the last uh, million years at the end. And you can see, if you look at these two lines, above what the two degree line and what the four degree line means. The two degrees will move us back millions of years in climatic history. When average temperatures across the planet were much higher than today. And four degrees will take us all the way back 40 million years to a time where there was no ice on Earth, no Antarctic, no Arctic, and no uh, uh, glaciers. So a two degree increase is really a huge change. The average temperature on the planet is about 14 degrees. So a two degree change upwards or down, it's a bit like our own bodies. We can survive at 37, but a two degree increase or a two degree decrease has a huge effect on our health. And it's the same with the planet. It's a very finely balanced system. So what can we do to avoid this crisis? Well, the way we're looking at it is this, that there are several hurdles that we need to overcome. We need to unravel a vastly complex and unstable financial system. The financial system is a huge part of our economies and a huge part of the of our economies and is driving a great deal of the economic activity. So one of the things we have to do is to dismantle the financial system and do that in such a way that it causes an even. We also have to face up to the challenges of new technology which are going to create more unemployment and then boost inequality and find a way to accept that new technology, but manage it in such a way that we can create jobs and reduce inequality. And we also, within that, have to manage the power of the big corporations, because we have three major actors in our economies. We have the markets, we have governments, and we have corporations. And the corporations are driving a great deal of the economic agenda. We also have to overcome the belief that we need economic growth. There's a strong belief, certainly in the developed world, but increasingly in the developing world, that the only economic policy that makes any sense is based on more economic growth. That we can't live without economic growth. That economic growth gives us everything else. And that's simply not true. We can have an economic system that does not depend on further throughput of resources uh, and greater pollution. We have to find a way of making an energy transition so that we can avoid that two degree increase in average temperatures. And we have to find a way to feed eight or nine billion people with all these other changes taking place. 
That then has to take us to a system where we have an economic model which is sustainable, and then we can try and improve it to make it better for people. Now, our conclusions, and this is tentative because it's not going to be published for a few weeks, is that all of these things are technically possible. We can overcome these problems. Still, there's still time. We have the knowledge, we have the capability to do it. What we're lacking is the political systems and the motivation. It is possible to overcome these. The time is getting narrower, but it is still possible for us to overcome all those problems and move to a better system. What we need is the political will. And that's really what I want to say finally. That we need a new sort of political leadership. Alexander talked earlier on about the failure of these climate change meetings, and it's because we have a failed political system. Our political leaders are not doing what we need. The pursuit of growth after the Second World War was once very good, but now it's the source of our problems. Economic growth is the source of pollution and then the source of climate change. It's the source of inequality because it drives higher levels of, of income being drifting towards the rich. And it's a source of unemployment because it's always driving greater efficiency. So more growth is not the answer. More growth will make these things worse. And so everything that we hear about from our politicians about increasing growth is just going to make the situation worse. It's going to drive further in the wrong direction. Green business, where businesses behave more responsibly in the circular economy, where we have businesses which make products which are easily recyclable or, or can be designed for longer use, that will all help solve the problem. And the market, the market cannot solve this problem. The market cannot solve climate change or inequality because it's the source of these problems. The only solution that we can see is that we need strong governance and we need a functioning global governance system and that means a different sort of politician so those of you who want to become politically active you know i would urge you to go out and do that we need a different sort of voice we need a different sort of political leader because we need to elect people that have a greater understanding of the problems and a greater vision for how to solve them and that's the message i'd like to leave you with that we can solve these but we need a different way of moving forward thank you Thank you, Graham. Maintenant, j'ai le plaisir de passer la parole au professeur Martin Beniston, qui est de l'Université de Genève. Il est également chair of the Climate Research and director for the Institute of Environment Sciences. Monsieur Beniston, vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Well, we've just seen that maybe one of the reasons why uh, action to combat climate change has been fairly lacking is because of uh, political leadership or lack thereof. I would also argue that possibly the way uh, science has been communicating about climate change is also has also been problematic over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, I was involved, I've been involved quite closely with the IPCC over two, two decades. And if the science is robust, the way it's being communicated is still very obscure to many uh, non-experts, I would say. And possibly the way we communicate could be also improved in order to show to lay people and policymakers what climate change is all about. Climatologists tend to talk about change with respect to time, temperature change, one degree per century, for example, what I'd like to do is just to show you through two or three slides what one degree per century actually translates into. I'll start with this graph where we see the statistics uh, of summer, summers in Geneva in terms of their temperature on the horizontal axis and precipitation on the vertical axis. Geneva as it was 50 or 60 years ago in the 1950s. Then we can do the same kind of uh, uh, statistical approach and look at a location which is about five or 600 kilometers to the south, which is Toulouse in southern France. And there you see that Toulouse in the 1950s was, uh, as you would expect, warmer and drier than Geneva, uh, simply because we were in a more Mediterranean climate. Now let's see what Geneva has been doing in the last 10 years or so. What we see now is Geneva today is warmer and almost as dry as Toulouse was 50 or 60 years ago. This is one other way of seeing what 
uh, a one degree change per century actually translates into. It's a northward movement of Mediterranean regimes at a rate of about 10 to 15 kilometers per year. So this gives you another perception of what uh, climate change uh, actually means. Another way of looking at climate change is uh, through more recent work we've been doing, is to imagine what climate would be today, uh, merci beaucoup, what climate change would be today if it had remained roughly stable around the type of climate we had in the 1950s. So we can look at uh, the hot summers that we've been living through. Uh, this is the exceedance of 30 degree threshold in the 1950s and in the more recent decade. And you see that we have a substantial rise in the number of days that exceed 30 degrees from about 85 in the 1950s to something like 200 over the last decade. Now, if climate had remained stable, if for some reason we had started to address climate change already in the 1950s, managed to keep it stable, then what we would have seen would be this. So, roughly the same number of days in the 1950s in a stable climate, but a substantial reduction or almost no rise in the number of very hot days in the most recent decades. You see that we have about one third of hot days uh, if we had remained in sort of 1950s type of climate. And we can do the same exercise for very hot days, 35 degree threshold. You see that in the most recent decade, we've lived through about 25 or 26 days here in Geneva with temperatures exceeding uh, 35 degrees. And if we'd remained in a stable climate, and we would have something like six or seven days only, so about a quarter of the number of days. Now, when you imagine the impacts that these very uh, extreme heat waves that we've been living through, 2003, and more recently, 2015, July 2015 was the hottest summer on record in many parts of Europe, including here in Geneva. When you see the impacts that these uh, very damaging heat waves uh, uh, impose, on water resources and agriculture, human health, of course, then uh, this should mobilize societies to do what their utmost to try and limit the future course of warming. Because as we go towards warmer and warmer temperatures, of course, the impacts will be stronger and stronger. Also, just to give you an idea what a one degree uh, change in temperature actually means, this is uh, an animation of the change in the uh, length and surface area of the Rhone Glacier, which is the source of the Rhone River that flows into the Lake of Geneva here. This is uh, what we've been seeing with the 1.5 degree warming, uh, a fairly small change or apparently small change in the length of the glacier, but still about a one kilometer change over this glacier, which overall has 10 kilometers in length. And if we go to an additional two to three degrees warming, then this is what the glacier might ultimately look like by the end of the century. So you see what we've lived through over a century or more is nothing compared to what we might live through in the future. And this, of course, will change the way the glaciers actually provide water to rivers that are important, not only for economic activities within the Alps themselves, such as hydropower, for example, but I would say especially for lowland regions outside of the Alpine domain that depend upon water resources for many economic activities. And this is a typic, the typical curve of uh, discharge in the Rhone River as it enters the Lake of Geneva, with high discharge during the summer months because of the melting of the uh, mountain snowpack at the end of the winter, and continuing to have substantial amounts of water uh, in, into the uh, late summer, the hot part of the summer, because of melting glaciers. This is what we might actually be living through in the next 50 or, or 100 years or so, a flattening, flattening out of the discharge curve, a little bit more uh, discharge in winter because of early snow melt, but substantial reductions, anything by, by up to 70 or 80 percent reductions in water supply uh, in the summer months uh, because of the vast changes that we're likely to see in terms of rising temperatures, declines in summertime precipitation, the early uh, melting of snow, and the quasi disappearance, as we saw in the last animation, of alpine glaciers. So this is the kind of world we will be uh, looking at as we move into the coming decades. And this also should mobilize uh, societies and policymakers to do their utmost to limit global warming to two degrees. This will not necessarily be a safe limit, but it will certainly be a, be a better limit than four or five or six degrees global warming by the end of the century. Thank you very much for your attention.
Merci, professeur Beniston. Là, c'est le tour de Mohan Munasinghe de prendre la parole. Mohan est le chairman du the Munasinghe Institute for Development et former vice president of the IPCC. Il est aussi peaceful laureate avec IPCC. Mohan, please. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Let me move quickly to the point because uh, I have very little time to make uh, my presentation. Basically, um, if I could, I can't see whether the first, okay, the first slide is on. Uh, okay. I want to briefly summarize what I think are some of the key issues, some among the many, and then uh, consider some of the options that are available. If you look here, uh, and previous speakers have highlighted many of these points, but I'm trying to put it together as a nexus, because the problems come together in bundles, and they are synergistic. The top left-hand corner uh, highlights the point that we, 2012, were uh, consuming 1.5 worth of resources as a human race. So basically, uh, it was unsustainable. By 2030, we will need two planets uh, to support our lifestyles. On the top right-hand side, you see uh, the essence of some elements of the inequalities that were mentioned also by previous speakers. But uh, one of them is uh, very important that by next year, the 1% of the richest people in the world will have as much wealth as the other 99%. Okay? So um, the rich are already consuming more than one planet worth. And at the bottom, we have the promises made by world leaders. We had the Millennium Development Goals, but also now 17 new uh, sustainable goals and the like. So the question that I have asked uh, world leaders at several meetings, much to the embarrassment, is if the rich are already consuming more than one planet worth, where are the resources to raise the poor out of poverty? Right. Uh, that is one of the key issues. These are the 17 sustainable development goals that have emerged after Rio Plus 20 and the post-2015 agenda discussions. Now, you will see, um, although I was introduced as a vice chair of the IPCC, why I have not spoken so much about climate. It is important, but it is only one of 17 goals. The importance of climate, of course, is that it makes all the other problems worse. Okay, this is very clear. But we already have enough problems us as a human race. Long before climate change hits us with great intensity, the nexus of food, energy, water, all of those problems coming together will cause much more severe disruption. Right? Not to mention conflicts. I mean, Syria is classic example, the flow of refugees. If you add to this potentially environmental refugees and other things, you're going to have serious problems long before climate change hits us seriously. But now let us move on now and see, I mean, we are thinking of a vision of a 21st century eco-civilization, but we are far from it, right? Um, one of the problems which have been mentioned by earlier speakers is, has to do with values and behavior. So while we focus on technology and what can be done politically and so on, actually the focus on material consumption and the belief in concepts like GNP and, and so on, uh, plus the firm belief in people that the more they consume, the better off they must be. These are some of the myths uh, that are actually contributing uh, to the business as usual approach. I'm working, for example, with the government of Bhutan, the king of Bhutan, on a concept called gross national happiness, uh, which you may have heard of. But basically, there are other ways to measure 
well-being, happiness, without focusing exclusively on material consumption. And that is one of the, the major issues we have. Um, if we move to the next one, this is a kind of vision that we are looking at, that we are looking for a social system which meets the basic needs of all human beings on the planet, including the two billion poor who now are there. But also includes elements like social justice and empowerment and peace and security. On the environmental side, most broadly, we need to live within the sustainable carrying capacity of one planet, right? And of course, on the economic side, in a world with many poor people, we do need economic prosperity, but we need, as previous speakers have said, to respect critical environmental and social concerns. Now, can we do this? Um, this is a slide that I presented some time ago, at, in fact, at the Copenhagen uh, climate meetings. But if you look at climate as a sort of a metaphor, on the vertical axis, you see greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, and on the horizontal axis, you GNP. Now, if you're a poor country, you are at point A, which means low emissions, low GNP. If you're a rich country, you're at point C, you're emitting above the safe limit, but you're also rich, right? And many other countries are at B in between. Now, the first part of this compact has to be that those who are, in a sense, over-consuming, this is not necessarily only in terms of climate emissions, but also food, uh, and energy and other things. It's a metaphor. They need to come down in their yeah. consumption, but they can maintain a very good quality of life. And many studies of resource efficiency have pointed this out, that you don't have to give up the good life. We know the technology and so on. It's again a question of values and behavior, right? But there's another part of the compact, and that is those who are rising on the curve have to find a different path. We cannot have seven or soon eight or nine billion people on the planet trying to consume at the same level of uh, the United States. Uh, there are not enough resources on, on the planet to copy that profligate lifestyle. Now, there is there a tunnel? Yes, we know the technologies and so on. It is again a question of implementation uh, to find uh, this path. And basically, that slide summarizes it. We need to have more sustainable consumption and for those who consume a lot, the rich family, but we also have to raise the poor out of poverty along a more sustainable path. Right? Now, I, uh, will, uh, I will not end uh, with just a, a doom and gloom uh, message, but to tell you that we do know how to overcome these problems. We can find integrated and comprehensive solutions, scientifically speaking, and models. What we are actually facing is weak leadership, OK? And uh, if we are waiting for top-down solutions for prime ministers and presidents to tell us what to do, then I believe personally that we are doomed. I think we are seeking bottom-up uh, solutions. And basically, not only you and I, okay, but also the middle level of leadership, uh, CEOs of companies, uh, community leaders, mayors of cities, we are having much more action at that level and not necessarily at the very top. So this is extremely important. We have to respect the the harmony of the Sustainable Development Triangle. Uh, and we have to break down stakeholder barriers so that business and civil society can actually work with government, actually push governments to do make the right uh, decisions. And we need also to think of sustainable consumption and production patterns, which is one of the important elements of the Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs, by the way, look formidable. There are 17, there are 169 indicators and sub-goals and so on. One can get lost. But this is, does not mean that every country has to practice everything.
for it. Okay, there is a process where you can choose what are most important for you as a, along your development path, but it is a useful checklist. And for once, this is universal. It is not just something for the developing countries, which was the MDGs. This is for all countries. And to me, the sustainable consumption and production element is one of the most uh, important elements. So let me end there basically saying that this sustainable development is like learning to climb a mountain. The peak is covered with clouds. It's a little bit mysterious. But as long as you keep learning to step up, uh, go uphill, you will reach the peak one day. Okay, And that means not waiting for high ups to tell you what to do. And when you leave this room, you switch off the light. If you see a tap leaking, you close it. You can plant a tree. You can eat less meat. So not to feel disempowered, but to act now collectively and individually. That is my final message. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mohan, for your interesting presentation. I forgot to say that you you were a board member of Green Cross International. You just stepped out yesterday. And you are, by the way, senior advisor to the president, the new president of Sri Lanka. Well, now we have Mr. Ivo Slaus, honorary president of the World Academy of Art and Science. Mr. Slaus, you have the floor, please. Distinguished participants, as the keynote speaker said, and of course, as panelists emphasized, yes, we are actually facing a very serious crisis economically, politically, socially, and ecologically, and indeed, natural capital and human and social capital have been and are and continue to be severely reduced, destroyed, and indeed, when one looks at this situation, the question is, how can we come out of the present predicament? And this was precisely what was the, the word of the first panelist, uh, uh, Graham Maxton. Where are the culprits? Obviously, the main culprits are in the economy and in the political sphere. Economy as it is today is the economy to repeat the phrase, this economy kills. As we know, the data showed that actually in the last 20 years, 423 million people have died. This is when you compare it with all sorts of other disasters, for instance, with the Second World War, more people died because of poverty than per year than during the Second World War, which itself uh, indeed underlines this, uh, that this economy has changed. This led the World Academy to the point to conclude that, that what is needed is a paradigm shift. The paradigm which is comparable to the paradigm shift that we had in natural sciences, in physics, at the turn of the 19th into 20th century, when we had the quantum physics and the theory of relativity, or to put it in a more subtle domain, the shift which occurred during the Neolithic agricultural revolution. And just as at that time we learn to live together with animals and with various plants, now be in a position to have to share our world, our civilization, and robots, of course, influencing on the question of the work and, of course, making the future work very specific. It was very important to hear the speech of Mr. Poshan from ILO, where he pointed out that indeed the question of unemployment, the question of jobs, and the question of protecting the environment are two parallel ways of solving the problem. So parallelly, we can do a world which everybody is employed and assure the environment not 
to be destroyed. In all of this, of course, uh, science and technology do play a role, and the role that they play is obviously seen now by an enormous increase in scientific output. When you compare it now, the amount of scientific knowledge doubles every eight or nine years. This is much, much faster than it ever was in the history of humankind. And when you look now in all scientific disciplines, one can foresee major breaks. And not only that, we have domains in interdisciplinary and in transdisciplinary sciences in our very understanding of the idea of thinking where all of this is actually needed and is necessary. So the world we live in now actually is the world which maybe can be adequately described by the famous opening sentence of Dickens' novel, The Tale of the Two Cities. This is, to invert it actually as it is there, this is the worst of time because we really are now facing very serious critical situation. But this is the best of time if, of course, we use the creative capacity of the humankind. And if, as one of the keynote speakers, Madame Corinne Lepage, said, we are those who are responsible for all of this because these are things that we, as human beings, can change. We can change the economy we can change the political structure we have and we can come out of this existing paradigm which is inadequate for this planet which is being overused by more than 50 percent which is inadequate for us its inhabitants is inadequate for other creatures because as it was said we are now at the nearly in the middle of the extinction period, which is as large as it was ever before. So yes, we have to save this planet that we live on, because though we, throughout our history, we did move from Africa and colonize the rest of the world, and sooner or later, we will colonize most of the, at least, neighboring part of, uh, of our system, it was, uh, our galactic system, but this journey is much more difficult than the one that was done when we left uh, Africa and of course is not there to be done soon, so it is imperative to save the earth we live on and to save the creative capacity of humankind. Thank you very much. Merci, Professor Slaus. Fiona is going to moderate the, the discussion now. Please, you put your hand up, and uh, after that, you push on the button, and so you have the floor, I mean, the, the microphone, and we can ask a question, okay? Who is starting? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you to um, our panelists. That's got us off to an absolutely flying start. Um, we've heard a, a, a great deal uh, of information there to, um, to mull over. Um, and now I'd like you to take part. I'd like you to um, think of your questions that you'd like to ask um, our panelists or indeed interventions uh, or remarks you'd like to make. I'd like you to keep those questions brief and any remarks also concise. Um, if you want to ask a question, if you could raise your hands and then I'll come to you. Um, and um, you all, I believe, have a microphone uh, in front of you. So while you um, just think of that, I'm going to just take the moderator's privilege and ask um, brief questions to our um, panelists just on some of what we've just heard. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Graham and Mohan uh, first you made um, a passionate uh, case for tackling inequality um, and uh, a very, very cogent arguments there. But what if, uh, what if we are unequal because we want to be unequal? What if that is actually our natural state um, as human beings? Um, shouldn't we then just accept that and get on with it? What do you think of that? Graham, I'll take you first then, Martin. <laughs> uh, 
Um, that's a very good and a very difficult question because we've been puzzling the same question. If you go back over the last 1,000, 2,000 years of history, the gap between rich and poor for most of that time has been huge. I mean, you've got a tiny rich elite and 90% of the people really very poor, scrabbling for an existence. And so I think there's a very good question. You know, is the last 50 years, the last 60 years of economic history a blip? Is it possible that the natural state is where there is a huge gap between rich and poor? Um, it's certainly possible that if we have to save the planet, we may have to increase inequality. I mean, I think that's, it's not the route that any of us want to go, but we have to save the planet before we do anything else. We have to save humanity. So I think we should remain open to that, to that question. But of course, it's much more likely that we're going to have civil disorder because there's a strong correlation between inequality and ill health and civil disorder if we carry on down the current path. And so it's clearly far better if we can find a way of closing that gap. We can do that without necessarily uh, creating lots of legislation. We can do that by, by increasing um, the amount of holiday that people have in the developed world, for example. So that, so that companies have to pay them more. We can do that uh, by increasing welfare payments. We can reduce the gap between rich and poor without creating any sort of massive social instability. But I do think you're right. I mean, there, there's a question that we need to have a debate about that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And Roland, what's your response? Um, well, this is actually a deep question because if you, you one could take the point of view of say ecologists through natural selection you say well if it's the survival of the fittest then those uh, who are weakest uh, will succumb first and the human race as a whole will uh, progress because it's the stronger who survive okay and uh, but uh, there are also principles of ethics and morality and a, a Rawlsian approach which says that we look at the weakest first and we try to help them. So, I mean, there are different ways of looking at it, but as a human race, we do not want, want to go back to the tooth and claw natural selection approach that we somehow feel, I mean, the good part of us feels that we have to help the poor. This is why uh, in the three principles I laid down, the first one, which is basically if we can meet the basic needs of every human being, the basic needs, then everybody starts on a level playing field. After that, you have choices. Different people and different societies will have different aspirations. So some may pursue material consumption more, others may say we want a better environment or we want a more inclusive society. So uh, the, the basic needs part, is the equalizer. I think that is what we are trying to achieve through the sustainable development goals. But beyond that, we don't want a cookie cutter society where everybody's levelized. That is not the approach. And third, but not least, last but not least, is the environment itself. Because in order to reach these aspirations of meeting the basic needs of seven or eight billion people and then beyond that giving people choices how of how to enrich their lives we need a good environment okay and the ecological sources the the, the uh, ecological um, resources and the services it provides so you have the elements of all of that i don't think we need to pose the question starkly as saying well isn't inequality a, a natural thing. I would reject that approach simply because we are human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beth. And uh, Ivo, you, you wanted to come in there as well. Yeah, on this issue of uh, inequality, of course, uh, we are not equal and uh, there is nothing bad in that that we are not equal. Uh, in many ways, we are different, and the difference is enriching us. What you are really pointing out is the difference in material goods. Uh, this is what the core of your question is. It was addressed uh, originally by uh, Plato, so 
two millennia ago, when he argued that the difference between the richest and the, those who have less, of course he excluded slaves and so on, should not be larger than a factor of five. But then as, as we go closer to us, uh, it was J.P. Morgan who said that it should not be more than one over 20. What we have now is a ridiculous amount of differences which are economically actually wrong and don't do anything. Uh, they are not even reflecting the structure of power because the structure of power, which of course is one of the basic desire of the human being, as Alvin Toffler said, power is no longer in wealth. Power is now in knowledge or, and in creativity. So that is totally economically useless, socially useless, it is just distracting and adding the enormous destruction of the of the nature through enormous consumption having five cars instead of two that are at most needed having thousand uh, shoes uh, except of two or three or four you know thank you very much um that's uh, some very important points there and i just i'd like to to just take the scientists now and just ask um we uh we heard uh, we've heard a great deal this morning um, about how clear uh, the message uh, from scientists is. Uh, you know, your, your presentation, Martin, was very clear on that and what we can uh, what we can expect uh, in the future if we carry on as we are. Why are people not listening to scientists? Is it is it because they don't like what the scientists are saying, or is it because the scientists are saying it wrong? Um, you know. Scientists some, sometimes can be a bit equivocal in what they say. People can get the impression that scientists are, disagree with one another. Um, if science is so clear, why are we not listening to it? Mike, I'll take you first. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good question that we scientists often ask ourselves as well. I think in the context of climate change, this is often wrongly perceived as being a, a long-term uh, process and that there's, there's still time to act, whereas uh, actually science uh, suggests that this is the contrary. You have to act today to start slowing down the course of climate change over the next year or 100 years. And of course, there are uh, in public perception more immediate problems, you know, problems of security, problems of unemployment, uh, economic uh, considerations and so on, which are perceived as being, you know, today's problems and we can leave uh, issues of the environment and climate uh, we can leave that for a bit later on. Uh, and as I say, unfortunately, this is a wrong perception since we do need to act today to start to make inroads into uh, climate warming uh, over the next 50 or 100 years. Thank you for that. Um, Graham, I'll take you in a moment. I just wanted to give uh, Evo a chance to respond as well. Uh, listening to the scientists maybe uh, one can address it in a simpler way uh, listening to the physicians to mds to doctors and of course uh, doctors would tell us uh, with convincing argument that smoking is wrong still there are people who smoke as a matter of fact there is a large number of people who smoke then there was a recent question of uh, vaccination and uh, uh, obviously is to the great advantage that we vaccinate. Now, what happened there? There are various things have happened. And of course, just like in the smoking, there was an enormous uh, input of the business that had vested interest in doing that. Similarly, of course, in the case of vaccination, there is again vested interest. So, uh, and most of these things are, of course, complicated in the social context. So all of this makes these things uh, very, very difficult. In specific question of the climate warming is scientists did and did very well what we always do, namely, objectively, scientifically, pointed out, yes, there is a danger if uh, the temperature of the Earth increases by more than two degrees. Now, as an ordinary person, two degrees, okay, so what? I mean, instead of walking with the jacket, I take off my jacket. 
The real story is that this is not that, as you have shown previously, is the, extre is the extreme weather, is the danger, for instance, uh, of the melting of the ice of the, of the Arctic, uh, is the danger of the Gulf Stream turning around, and so on, and so on. And this is now not the job of scientists only to say, is a job of the people in political leadership to really transfer this information to the public. They, of course, did not do it because for them, this is an irrelevant factor that comes in the process of getting political power, being elected, or maintaining the political power. And of course, the advice they get from scientists is again something that they are not necessarily going to do. So this entire story, can, can we have an advisor? Can we have something like Aristotle was to Philip II and Alexander. Really not. I think at this stage of the game, really not. We don't have any scientific, any political leader who is close as well educated as Alexander was for a very easy task to conquer the world, and we have much more difficult tasks now. Thank you very much indeed. If we have any Philips or Alexanders in the hall, you can make yourselves known. Um, Graham. I, just, I, I think there's three reasons why people don't listen to the science. First of all, there's a whole industry out there sowing the seeds of doubt, funded by the oil industry, funded by the coal industry, who have a vested interest in making sure that we all think that perhaps the science is not clear. So it's a, a massive lobbying uh, effort in Washington and Brussels and the rest of the world to try and convince us that you shouldn't listen to the scientists. Secondly, I think we've all become experts in everything. We all think we know about economics, we all think we know about climate science, and so opinion is more important than knowledge. So, you know, people come along to me and they tell me about what economics and economists should be doing to fix the world's problems without understanding anything about economics. And we're doing the same thing. And thirdly, you know, the scientific evidence goes against the vested interests of the rich. And that's really the crux of the matter. We need to <laughs> undermine the vested interests of the rich, and that's when we can get the science to be listened to. Thank you very much for that. And Mohan, can you? Yeah. Just, I agree fully with the previous speaker that it is the vested interests of the rich and climate change is a classic example where the fossil fuel lobbies have consistently undermined the message of the IPCC. But there's also the element of what sells newspapers in a sense. People do not want to hear uh, stuff that is boring or uh, too alarming. Uh, they want to read about murders and sex and the like. So we have to change. I mean, there have to be uh, there has to be a kind of a cultural shift uh, in what uh, in what uh, in terms of responsible uh, communication and the speed of change. Because let us agree that change will come. Either we fall off a cliff and the whole world gets rearranged, or we manage to do it gradually. Either way, change will come. The question is, the scientific message, is it conveying this in a, in a proper way? Because if it's too much gloom and doom, then people tune you out because they don't want to hear the bad story. If you downplay it, then people will say, ah, let, let's leave it for the next, uh, you know, in another 10 years to solve. So it's a very fine line. And the third and the last element is, are we using the right means? Uh, I'll give you a, a very uh, personal example. I mean, the kind of discussion we are having uh, is reaching maybe 1% of the world's population. When I was in uh, Rio Plus 20, at, uh, I'm, uh, outside the official forum, on the beaches, I met a group of musicians and we formed an organization called Sustaino Musica, which is the music of sustainability. And this has grown. We have a Facebook page. Basically, what people do is they exchange little clips, I mean, in MP4 files with music and, you know, nature and so on. And I think that is reaching many more people than all these learned discourses. So, uh, again, the, the, the message of science somehow we must find a better media in order to communicate. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. So communication is, is key. And um, on that note, uh, I invite you in the hall to communicate uh, with our panel. And also, I think you can see the, the, the Twitter thing that's, that's going on. So do feel free, free to tweet. And people who are outside the hall, um, I think I may be able to take comments or questions from you if you uh, sort of tweet them and I can see them. So we've got questions. Uh, we've got a, a, a lady here um, and we've got a gentleman here. Um, I'll, I'll take you first, madam, and then you, sir. Sorry. There's... Hello. Um, I have a question for Mr. Maxton. Um, your last recommendation was uh, to go for political change. You said we should elect people with understanding and vision. Well, as a citizen who votes, I am not sure how to implement this recommendation. Um, I have a few ideas, but very often they don't make it to the second round. Um, and uh, so we've heard other recommendations, including Mohan's recommendation, which is to stand up and to do our own, you know, duty. Um, but I was curious about what you really meant by that. Do you mean that we should all get more involved in politics? Is that really what you mean? Because I'm not sure how to, to, to be able to do that uh, in another way. Thank you. Uh, again, I mean, it's a very good question. I, I agree with Mahan when he talks about, about grassroots and about having to come up from below. Because the existing political system, the existing party system, the, the democratic process, which is so confrontational, is not producing the sort of leaders that we need. Um, one of the things that, that we're doing in the, in the Club of Rome is that we're exploring the idea of, of developing a youth initiative. Because, because we realize, too, that you know, a lot of the message that we've given out for the last 40 years hasn't had the impact that it should have. You know, we've been speaking to political leaders and those who influence them, and it hasn't had the change that we said was necessary more than 40 years ago. So we feel a need to communicate across a broad base and a younger population to try and help educate them about understanding and make them realize that they can change the way economics is taught. They can campaign against things like, like uh, palm oil in, in everything they consume and give them, give them a sense of the danger that we're facing so that we can spread the message more widely. But I think you're right, it has to be, it has to be a political movement in a different format from the one that we've had before. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, answer there. And sorry, we had you up here. If you could. Uh, Jeremy McTague uh, from uh, Le News. I'm just uh, interested in your views on how important it is to address corruption at the highest political and uh, corporate levels if we are to um, basically come up with the sort of sustainable changes that you have quite rightly been uh, suggesting. Thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, who would like to take that one on first? Shall we? Well, and you, 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 yeah. you can have the, uh, the pleasure of taking that first. Yeah. Uh, all I can, I mean, let me answer it tangentially and also anecdotally. Uh, in the sense, you may have or may not have heard that recently in Sri Lanka we had an election for a president in January of this year. The incumbent was enormously corrupt, had run for 10 years, but controlled all the media, um, the military, and, and every possible lever of power, in, including stacking the Supreme Court, right? So the question was, with all of that money and all that influence, was there any hope? Well, through a democratic process, the challenger won and, in fact, has instituted a number of anti-corruption measures. We shall see how it moves forward. But I think the difference here, and I'm combining it with the previous answers, the question as well, in a sense, that although the traditional media like television and newspaper and so on were controlled by the incumbent, the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and other means, uh, indigenous social media in our own language, were working counter. And there the anti-corruption message was very strong. So basically 
the rich and the powerful who benefit from the existing system, just like the coal and the oil and the fossil fuel lobbies, will resist the anti-corruption calls, the lobbyists. But among ordinary people, there is a tremendous wellspring. How do you mobilize that? I just gave you the example of Sri Lanka because it is not a hopeless thing. We, we, we made the change in a bloodless way, uh, and it can be done. I think anti-corruption is a very, very powerful message. The, it has to be communicated in the right way, and that there has to be the right media where this can be circulated. And social media are very uh, helpful in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and that's very pertinent as uh, most of our panelists can't actually see this, but I can, which is uh, how we're doing on social media where we've got um, lots of people taking part uh, on Twitter and on YouTube. So I'd like to thank them for taking part as well. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists because uh, I'm afraid having started rather late uh, with this panel, um, I'm now about to start running into your lunchtime and long experience has taught me far better than to get between an audience and its lunch. So um, I'd just like to just sum up where we are. We had um, some really important points made there uh, about science and how science is moving forward, about the communication of science and it's really all of our roles uh, to communicate science. You know, social media, as you say, makes it possible for, for everyone to do so. It also makes it possible for people to have debates about these pressing issues of inequality and development. Do we have to accept inequality? Should we be fighting inequality? How can we do so? What kind of world do we want to see? Because really, and as Ivo said, we need vision and visionaries, and as Graham said, we need new types of politicians who have that vision um, and on our panel today I think we've had a lot of vision um, so I hope that that has really uh, really helped set the tone for the rest of the conference and I'd like to thank you and I'd like to thank our panelists and I'd like to thank the organizers thank you all very much Thank you very much, Fiona, and gentlemen, for um, this very interesting panel. Il y a une pause maintenant d'une heure, mais je crois que quelques dames à mes côtés souhaitent vous parler. Alors, ladies first, comme on dit, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much for postponing your lunch with maybe by three minutes. Attention. Um, I had the pleasure to introduce. Uh, the very inspiring One Heart, One Tree initiative of which Green Cross is becoming a partner. There's a two minutes video and then we'll just words. hope to have the possibility to discuss this with you after. Thank you. My name is Nadia Mestawi, and as an artist, my passion is to reconnect the virtual and the real, the invisible and the visible, technology and nature. I believe we can all inspire our future, and I think art is a good way to share and give the possibility to each of us to do something. And this is why I created the artwork One Heart, One Tree. I chose a significant international event to give birth to it, the United Nations Climate Conference taking place next December in Paris. With One Heart, One Free, we all have the power from all over the world to contribute in the past. It's a collective piece of art that transforms famous monuments, including the Eiffel Tower, into virtual forests using lighting and mapping technology. So you can virtually create a tree. You download a smartphone application, and by putting your finger on the sensor, your heartbeat is being recorded. Then you can see your tree with your name on it, growing at the rhythm of your heartbeat on the Eiffel Tower. And as each heartbeat is unique, each tree will also be totally unique. And here, the true beauty of it, each virtual tree is going to grow in real life, planted in a reforestation program. So the virtual becomes real. The aim is to plant millions of trees. 
And now we need you to become a creator of One Heart, One Tree. Entire forest can come back to life with water sources reappearing and lots of animals in just 15 years. It is the heartbeat of a person that gives birth through technology to another life, a tree. And if we're all connected, we can have a huge impact. And I already thank you for all your support. This artwork can only exist thanks to all of you. Nazia Mistawi. So hi, good morning. Uh, so I, I just wanted to briefly explain you the, the concept, and uh, you just saw the video, and this is really the idea to uh, build an artwork where all individuals can uh, get engaged into uh, climate change, and it's also giving the possibility for each person to be an actor. So everybody's gonna plant a real tree, and all people from all over the world are invited to be part of the project and they're going to see that tree growing symbolically on the Eiffel Tower with their name on it showing also that they feel responsible for our collective future. So One Heart One Tree is going to start on November 29th on the Eiffel Tower and run until uh, December 4th and you're all invited to be part of it. Thank you. Just to add that uh, Green Cross Reforestation Project will benefit from this initiative. Tonya Moya from Green Cross Sweden worked on this project. So this is the reason for the presence of the third lady on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci, mesdames. C'était pas prévu, mais c'était une très bonne présentation. On vous supporte, on vous soutient. Alors, puisque nous avons un peu de retard, je vous propose de commencer la deuxième partie de cette journée à 14h15. Voilà, merci, à tout à l'heure.